not, That's right. It's not an option. It's not discussed. It's not granted. Yeah, the number for Catholics is, is a good bit lower. And yes. That's, that's certainly one area where... That's right. And, that's right. And, and then that's where we need to do a second study, which uh, actually goes in and in detail looks at, okay, how many people are currently living in marriages that they would rather be divorced or would be happier if they were divorced and are stuck being miserable because of their religious uh, yeah. proclamations that marriage is some kind of sacred holy. It'd be nice, it'd be nice to be able to get at that information, but yeah. that'd be a tough thing to tease out, wouldn't it, with all the other, other, all the other things going on? Well, let's shift gears a little bit to the sanctity of human life. You, you see this a lot, in, especially in the abortion debates. Um, and I claim that this is a mechanism to claim uh, other people's children, is to go after other people's children and, and, and try to speak for them and, and, and do them. Well, the Bible's very clear that uh, a man's children, only the man, are his property. And that um, there's a, certainly a commandment not to covet other people's property. So uh, clearly uh, there, there's no, not, no support in this, this uh, speaking for other people's children, I don't think, in, in the Bible. What about God? Does he consider human life sacred? Well, the most common interaction of God in the Bible with humans is killing them. And, and if you flip through the Bible, you'll figure that out pretty quick. The second most common interaction, I believe, is ordering the killing of people. And then, and then you get the conversations and these sorts of things. So God doesn't consider human life sacred very clearly. Do Christians consider human life sacred? Well, there's certainly the claim. What about uh, the wars? What about wars? Well, Iraq and Afghanistan, we have uh, maybe uh, 600,000 Afghanis and Iraqis killed in this war, but you never hear about those. You only hear about American deaths. And I, I really have never heard too much um, religious folks claiming that we shouldn't be in this war, we should stop this war, certainly not lately. Um, this is going on and on. Uh, what about the long-term persecution and killing of Jews over, over centuries? Well, there, that, was that uh, an evidence of sanctity of human life? I don't think so. What about life extension? Do we, we don't have, we don't have uh, Christians going and saying, oh, we should have you know, longer lives and these sorts of things. What, what about cryogenics? No, no, they're not into that. Uh, what about cloning? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, sanctity of human life, we, we can make more life. Uh, but, but it turns out there's religious prohibitions against cloning. And it's not for the reason you think. The reason, the reason let me have a little diversion here, that, they, that the religions don't like cloning, is that cloning renders ridiculous the concept of the soul. So think about it. If, if I get cloned, um, either my clone has no soul, right, in which case we're creating soulless people running around like little zombies or whatever, and what happens when they ha turn out to be believers and they want, they want to eat the crackers at communion or they wanna, and they happen to behave morally just like everybody else? Well, then, then the whole religion concept that these people are different somehow kind of gets flushed down the toilet. The same sort of thing happened with in, in, uh, IVF, in vitro fertilization. That they thought that these people wouldn't have souls, this sort of thing. What if my clone shares my soul? Well, what, what happens here is if he gets cloned and somebody else gets cloned, we've got a whole string of people that supposedly share the same soul, and I'm no longer responsible for, or my soul is no longer responsible for what I do, right? So if I die, or, then I could be punished for all eternity for what my clone does, right? So it, this whole idea of responsibility goes out the window. Well, what if, what if uh, our clone has a soul? Well, then uh, that puts humans in control of creating souls. And so it takes God out of the picture. So no matter how you slice this, the whole, the whole idea of soul is, is rendered silly by cloning. So that's why the religions hate that. So uh, returning to the sanctity of human life, what's, what's really going on? Well, religions want to co-opt reproduction to make more potential believers. It's that simple. We know, everybody knows and everybody admits that God can't make more followers, otherwise he'd do that. So, so reproduction has to be co-opted, and especially the womb, which is you know, pretty magic, uh, what goes on in there. Uh, and that, if you can co-opt that, you can do pretty well as far as making more believers. So, and finally, you know, the religions aren't able to control their own flock. They, they can't do it through, through their own religious strictures, so they have to use secular laws to create more believers, and I think that's a, a real travesty. So, 
the, the point here is that human life is sacred to the extent that the life has some benefit to religion. If you're, if you're old and have a lot of money, then, then maybe, uh, maybe uh, your life is, uh, they want to have you as a believer. If you're a, you know, an, an Iraqi who happens to be Muslim, who cares? That's kind of how, how it works out. So I've talked about the sanctity of life, of marriage, of, of the, the World Trade Center. And it's just a mechanism to control or assert ownership over something else. And when you don't really have any basis for that assertion. So that's my deal. Please call in and, and uh, you know, expand on this or, or whatever. Tell me if I'm wrong. So we have a lot of car callers already, don't we? Yep, we got them lined up. And uh, okay. there's like 40 minutes left in the show. As a reminder, let me get this out of the way just in case we get tied up with calls and I don't get to. Um, we'll be going to dinner after the show. I mentioned it before. The dinner place has changed. Uh, to El Arroyo. They'll pop the address up later. Um, I want to make sure that we announce that because otherwise people end up going to Threadgills or wherever we've been in the past. So Yeah, we like, we like meeting our audience, so come on down. All right, so we've got on for Greg in Pittsburgh. How are you? Hey, guys. I uh, really enjoy the show. I uh, was listening uh, last week, and I think it was, um, it was Jeff and, uh, and Russell who were on. Mm-hmm. And they made a uh, comment about Stephen Hawking and how he sort of has an idea about what happened, quote unquote, before the day. And We're having a little trouble hearing you with the feedback. Can you can you tell us what Stephen Hawking said again? Uh, Stephen, well, Jeff made an appeal to Stephen Hawking along the lines of uh, of that. Well, it's really kind of bad. Oh boy. So. Try and sum it up real quick what the beef is because we're having an issue with the phone where we're getting the feedback again. Yeah, if you have your TV on, turn off the volume of the TV. Now, what, what I've got here on the notes that they took beforehand is, is that you have some object, you, you've got a beef with Stephen Hawking because he made a statement like M theory is just a theory. Well, yeah, because we, we make a very big deal about how evolution is not just a theory. And yet, you know, theory means so much more when it comes to science. And right. yet, when you talk about M theory and string theory, those are complete nonsense. I mean, they don't have, there's not, they're not falsifiable in any way. Yeah, well, there's a struggle right now to, 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 to figure out whether these things are falsifiable. And I, I do see your point, right, in that here's a thing that's called a theory that, that doesn't meet the strict criteria of, of having been you know, put to the test of falsifiability. So, yeah, I agree with you. I guess, I guess um, for better or worse, the word theory has, has been applied to M whatever, right, the, the, the string theory uh, right. uh, idea. So, you know, yes, it is kind of a misnomer, and, and I think it's good that you pointed that out. So, uh, and, and, and it is theory used in a different sense than, than what we mean by evolution is a theory that has, you know, withstood the test of time and, and had had lots of ways in which it might have been falsified. So, yeah, I think you've made a good point there. Yeah, I think the only thing we really have to do, have to do is make sure that, yeah, let's, let's face it, the average person has a very limited understanding of the scientific usage of word theory. The colloquial usage has trumped it um, pretty much universally. And so you get this confusion of language. Um, it would be, you know, uh, it would it would be fine to say this is a you know a hypo hypothesis um, and this is a theory, but that distinction isn't always uh, clear uh, to lay audiences. So I don't know that I'd read too much into. If anything, if, if from if what's written here is correct, and I apologize that we're not able to actually hear you well enough. Um, if if Hawking had said M theory is just a theory, then I'd say that he was actually using the colloquial and using it right um, in in his objection to it. Um, or at least his clarification of it. it probably would have been better had he said that you know this is our working of hypothesis this is the model mm -hmm. you know that we're in investigating or that we're talking about at this point um, but yeah I don't, I don't think it's I wish there was a better way I wish there was a, a better bit of language um, that we could use and, and it may be the case that there there are better words and labels that we can use it's just you have to popularize those as well. So now you're stuck with the choice between popularizing a new language with a new understanding or popularizing the accurate usage of the terms that already exist. By and large, in issues like these, I work 
to popularize the, the, the existing language in a way that makes the most sense, which is why I portray a particular definition for atheism. Um, because you could go out and ask a thousand people and hit ten dictionaries and get a bunch of conflicting information about atheism. What is it? And the emails that I get demonstrate that this is the case. And so when I put forward my usage of the term, um, it's because that's the context in which I'm going to use it. And I'm hoping that continued discussion or you know, the show going out like this and other people using it kind of raises people's awareness of that this is a, a usage that is better, that it, that it is uh, more clear than the muddled usage that we have with the terminology elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I think that one thing that you could say is instead of a string theory, you could maybe say string conjecture, and that would be a lot more scientific in terms of your... I agree. Your I agree. Yeah. And, and on that note, Craig, we're going to go down to other callers and see if we have the same issue on all the lines. But thanks a lot for the call. All right, thanks. Sure. We've got Sean in New York. Hey there, guys. How's it going? Good. Good. I can hear you, too, so it seems like communication will work. Okay. Hopefully Yay. we won't um, get the feedback. All right, well, uh, uh, you're getting feedback from me? No, no, not, no, 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 not no. so far. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, first of all, just so I'm not completely off topic, um, I do spend a good portion of the year living in New York City, and with the whole mosque situation, or quote-unquote mosque situation, um, you know, I actually visited the, the spot where they're proposing the ground, the ground zero, you know, cultural center. Ground people, zero mosque, right. Uh, talk to protesters and stuff. And uh, the whole idea of, you know, that being sacred ground, um, you know, the idea that because some or even most people look at that ground as sacred in some way, then everybody has to look at it as sacred in the same way um, strikes me as, you know, kind of ridiculous. Further, um, I was surprised to hear people say, maybe not surprised, but still a bit disturbed to say, well, they, even if they don't build their cultural center so close, they can build it farther away. So, I mean, basically, to me, that's like saying, well, we'll, we'll accept Islam to a certain degree, but we won't accept it that much. Right. Yeah. You know, which, or, or those I mean, blacks can use the back door instead of the front door. Right. <laughs> yeah, Something yeah, like and, that, and yeah. It seems that, that a little bit of acceptance <laughs> isn't really proper acceptance at all. But in any case... Um, now for something completely different, okay. really quick. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about how we kind of go about cosmological arguments and, and talking about them. I'm not going to present a, a cosmological argument, but it seems that when the theist presents one, a lot of times they start it off by asking, well, why is there something rather than nothing? Sure. Right? And it seems that, that atheists will be quick to grant, okay, there could have been something or, or nothing, but I wonder if the better response would be, well, why are we assuming that there could have been nothing to begin yeah, with? Yeah, we, we've done that a few times. And, and often uh, the, the theist, I think, in that position is assuming himself that there was a God there <laughs> when there right. was nothing, That's right? So, some, some nothing, right? Right. So, so if you want to say the initial premise is there was nothing, then you don't get to throw a God in there, right? <laughs> right. So, but, but, even, but it's still, uh, I mean, regardless of that, it seems that, that atheists are willing to grant this. But it seems to me, well, yeah. wh why should we even do that to begin with? Right. Um, I mean, yeah. our, our, ver our very existence demonstrates that there could be something. We, but, yeah, we just don't know at this point. Right, exactly. But that, and, and, it's, and I think that we should start to, start to call him out on that. I mean, what mm -hmm. evidence uh, or reason do we have to believe that nothing could no, have I'm, ever been I'm the case you. or I'm be an alternative? You. Yeah, I, I think it's worth pointing out that we've got no reason to think that nothing is even a possibility. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that the way... Uh, physicists and cosmologists use the term nothing that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in the colloquial. We're back to an issue of language. Uh, Lawrence Krauss has a good um, lecture called A Universe from Nothing right, that, yes, that, that tries to explain this really well. But yeah, I think your, your point's you know, one that should be made more often. Right. Well, that's, that, that's important to recognize also that, that you know, c current scientific models seem to be kind of not not totally adequate. I mean, when a you know when a when a uh, quantum physicist talks about nothing, it's not like a philosophical concept of nothing. You know, quantum foam or probability fields. That's not really nothing when we're talking about it. Right. Um, right. And and when you get into religious 